So you want to cast a spell in Mage the Awakening, second edition. Um, this is the short and sweet guide to help you learn. That way you can just use the little spell casting reminder thing in the appendix four at the back of the book from now on, hopefully. So because spell casting is a big thing in Mage the Awakening, what a surprise, um, getting used to this process as a player and as a storyteller really, really speeds up the game, helps the process for the whole table. So you're flinging more spells and less flipping through arcane books. That is kind of magey, but that's really boring, isn't it? All right, so this process is if you're using one of the existing spells in the core book or a supplement. Uh, if you want to create something that's kind of unique, just on the fly, uh, you, there's a whole creative thaumaturgy section in chapter four, lots of fours, um, that uh, you have to do first to kind of determine what the spell is and is it within your realm of grasp and kind of determine some levels for it. Once you do that, then this is actually how to cast spells. Um, creative thaumaturgy requires some, uh, some chit chat between you and the storyteller. Step one, pick your spell. Right out of the book, again, no, no creative thaumaturgy. Two, is this a rote or praxis? Um, if it is a rote or praxis, you get these cool little bonuses. If not, it is an improvised spell. If it's an improvised spell, you actually have to spend one mana if it contains a common or inferior arcana for you. So for my personal favorite, the Moros, if it's not death or matter, I gotta spend a mana. If it's death or matter, I'm good. This is a really good reason to check with your allies and be like, hey, can you cast this spell for me instead so I can save some mana? Assign your reach next. Uh, reach is uh, amplifications and modifications that you get from having a high amount of knowledge and then casting something that is actually kind of beneath your knowledge. You get one free reach for each dot of arcanum rating that you have that meets or exceeds the arcanum rating of the spell. So if you've got just two dots in a arcana, you get one reach for a two dot spell or two reach for a one dot spell. This is actually one of the reasons that rotes are so good because you act as if you have five dots in that. So even a low level one is casting a level one, a one dot spell with five reach for free. Um, now you can reach farther um, and get additional reach if need be, but this adds paradox to the pool and you can use reach for this kind of stuff. Once you've determined what to do with all that reach that you've got, you need to determine the additional factors of your spell. Uh, these will provide dice pool penalties to your final spell casting roll, but they allow you to change the size of the area that you're affecting or the duration or just making it hit harder. Next, you need to determine your yantras. These are the different magical tools or conditions, places that you're at that provide a additional dice pool uh, benefit uh, to your final casting. You are limited in the number of yantras you can use based on your gnosis, so double check that table. Um, and you can only use one for free as a quick reflexive action when you're casting. Um, and any additional ones extend the casting time but one turn. But that only matters if you're casting this spell instantly uh, and not as a ritual. As a ritual, obviously, you're spending more than just a few seconds. Make sure that you're doing this step after you determine any negatives from the additional factors because Yantras can provide a total dice pool benefit of plus five after offsetting any negatives from those additional factors. Okay, time to check your total dice pool. Is it looking a little low? If you're casting it as a ritual, you can add additional intervals of rituals to give you an additional die each time up to a maximum of plus five. So with your Yantras in this, you could get up to plus 10, um, but that does make it take a lot longer to cast based on your Gnosis. Again, after all that, if you've got a minus six, um, sorry, you just can't cast that spell. It's just too much. Bring it bring it down a notch. Um, but if it's negative five, all the way up to zero, even though it's a negative value, you still get a single chance dice. So, uh, you know, a one in 10 chance to pull it off. Good luck. But don't actually roll your uh, spell casting just yet. We've got a few more steps. Um, if you're good to cast a spell though, uh, you need to, this is where you would detect any mana that you need for like the inferior common arcana 
or to make it an indefinite duration so it just lasts until somebody comes around to you know dispel it or you can spend mana to reduce some of that paradox you may have accumulated from reach or casting it around sleepers um, your gnosis is very important for this as well because you can only spend so much mana per turn so again if you're casting instantly this might extend out the time you need to build up power and go all sun goku and summon up a spirit bomb kind of thing right okay now to determine what to do with that paradox you may have accumulated through all this process if you've accumulated even one point of it and then gotten rid of it through spending mana or using a dedicated magical tool um there's still a chance die on that paradox pool so we got to determine what to do with it you can either contain it in yourself and use your wisdom to hold it in or you can use uh you know the environment just throw it out there and who cares roll your paradox pool and then based on whether you're containing or releasing you'll determine the next steps if you're containing the paradox within yourself roll your wisdom pool each wisdom success removes a paradox success but you take one bashing damage that is resistant and you kind of just have to cure it over time naturally can't use magic on it and that kind of stuff if there are any successes left over after rolling your wisdom pool the storyteller will apply a paradox condition to your character but that's it however if you're releasing paradox every success that the paradox pool shows up the storyteller gets one free reach to basically mess with your spell in numerous different ways and i'll just leave that to the storyteller to look up but it also provides a penalty to your spell casting roll, which is coming up next. So if you're already at negative five and then decide here's some paradox and now you're negative six, you're gonna inflict the paradox and nothing's gonna happen. But by releasing paradox, you don't actually get any paradox conditions on yourself just off the bat, but you will if you dramatically fail the spell. With all the paradox done, or hey, maybe you were a good mage and didn't get any paradox to begin with, roll your spellcasting dice. All you need is a single success for the entire spell to happen exactly as you've described it with the amount of damage, the duration, the size, the scale, all that. One success is all you need. So having a dice pool of even five or six is actually pretty healthy. If you get an exceptional success, five successes normally or three with a praxis, then you get a step up in the primary spell factor. So it can, you know, hit harder or last longer. Uh, you can provide a uh, condition to you or the target that provides arcane beats or arcana beats uh, that gives you arcana XP. Um, you might get a refund on all the mana you spent and then an additional refund. So this is a very, very good reason to use mana to give yourself a bigger dice pool because maybe you'll get all that mana back and then some more. Um, or you can uh, use that exceptional success to remove the withstanding that a target has. So rather than having to um, push through their stamina or their composure or something like that, you just ignore it completely and that spell takes effect maximum force um so with all that uh have fun storming the castle